Section 10 of Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings. Chapters 25 through 27. Chapter 25. The Combat on the Crater Top. Not Wilkes, but Coniston, his drawling British voice. You, Greg Haljan, how nice. His voice broke off as he jerked his arm from me. My hand with the bullet projector came up, but with a sweeping blow he struck my wrist. The weapon dropped to the rocks. I fought instinctively. Those first few moments my mind was whirling with a shock of surprise. This was not Wilkes, but the brigand Coniston. His blow wrenched him around, awkward fighting in the air puff suits, with only a body weight of some thirty pounds. Coniston stumbled over the rocks. I had still scarce recovered my wits, but I avoided his outflung arms, and stooping, tried to recover my revolver. It lay nearby, but Coniston followed my scrambling steps and fell upon me. My foot struck the weapon. It slid away and fell down a crag into a six-foot pit. We locked together, and when I rose erect, he had me around the middle. His voice jangled with broken syllables in my receiver. Do for you now, Haljan. It was an eerie combat. We swayed, shoving, kicking, wrestling. His hold around my middle shut off the errant circulation. The warning buzz rang in my ears to mingle with the rasp of his curses. I flung him off, and my tiny errant motors recovered. He staggered away, but in a great leap came at me again. I was taller, heavier, and far stronger than Coniston, but I found him crafty, and where I was awkward in handling my lightness, he seemed more skillfully agile. I became aware that we were on the twenty-foot square grid of the observatory platform. It had a low metal railing. We surged against it. I caught a dizzying glimpse of the abyss. Then it receded as we bounced the other way. And then we fell to the grid. His helmet bashed against mine, striking as though butting with the side of his head to puncture my visor panel. His gloved fingers were trying to rip at the fabric around my throat. As we regained our feet, I flung him off, and bounded like a diver head first into him. He went backward, but skillfully kept his feet, gripped me again, and shoved me. I was tottering at the head of the staircase, falling, but I clutched at him. We fell some twenty or thirty feet to the next lower spider landing. The impact must have dazed us both. I recall my vague idea that we had fallen down the cliff. My Arendt's motor smashed, my air shut off. Then the air came again. The roaring in my ears was stilled, my head cleared, and I found that we were on the landing, fighting. He presently broke away from me, bounded to the summit, with me after him. In the close confines of the suit, I was bathed in sweat and gasping. I had had no thought to increase the oxygen content of my air, but I sorely needed more oxygen for my laboring, pounding heart and my panting breath. I fumbled for the oxygen control lever. I could not find it, or it would not operate. I realized I was fighting sluggishly, almost aimlessly, but so was Coniston. It seemed dreamlike, a phantasmagoria of blows and staggering steps a nightmare with only the horrible vision of this goggled helmet always before my eyes. It seemed that we were rolling on the ground, back on the summit. The unshadowed earth light was clear and bright. The abyss was beside me. Coniston rolling was now on top, now under me, trying to shove me over the brink. It was all like a dream, as though I were asleep, dreaming that I did not have enough air. I strove to keep my senses. He was struggling to roll me over the brink. Ah, that would not do. But I was so tired. One cannot fight without oxygen. I suddenly knew that I had shaken him off and gained my feet. He rose up, swaying. He was as tired, confused, half asphyxiated as I. The brink of the abyss was behind us. I lunged, desperately shoving, avoiding his clutch. He went over and fell soundlessly his body whirling end over end down into the shadows far down. I drew back. My senses faded, 
as I sank panting to the rocks. But with inactivity, my thumping heart quieted. My respiration slowed. The errant circulation gained on my poisoned air. It purified. That blessed oxygen. My head cleared again. Strength came to me. I felt better. Coniston had fallen to his death. I was victor. I went to the brink, cautiously, for I was still dizzy. I could see, far down there on the crater floor, a little patch of earthlight in which a mashed human figure was lying. I staggered back again. A moment or two must have passed while I stood there on the summit, with my senses clearing and my strength renewed as the bloodstream cleared in my veins. I was Victor. Coniston was dead. I saw now, down on the lower staircase below the camp ledge, another goggled figure lying huddled. That was Wilkes, no doubt. Coniston had doubtless caught him there, surprised him, killed him. My attention, as I stood gazing, went down to the camp buildings. Another figure was outside. It bounded along the ledge, reached the foot of the ascending staircase at the top of which I was standing. With agile leaps, it came mounting at me. Another brigand? Miko? No, it was not large enough to be Miko, not nearly large enough. I was still confused. I thought of Han, but that was absurd. Han was in the wreck of the Planetara. One of the stewards, then. The figure came up the staircase recklessly to assail me. I took a step backward, bracing myself to receive this new antagonist. And then I saw Miko. Unquestionably he, for there was no mistaking his giant figure. He was down on the camp ledge, running toward the foot of the staircase, coming up to help this other man in advance of him. I thought of my revolver. I turned to try and find it. I was aware that the first of my assailants was at the stairhead. I could not locate at once where the revolver had fallen. I would be caught, leaped upon from behind. Should I run? I swung back to see what the oncoming brigand was doing. He had reached the summit. His arms went up, legs bent under him. With a sailing leap, he launched for me. I could have bounded way, but with a last look to locate the revolver, I braced myself for the shock. The figure hit me. It was small and light in my clutching arms. I recall I saw that Miko was halfway up the staircase. I gripped my assailant. The autophone contact brought a voice. Greg, is it you? It was Anita clutching at me. Chapter 26, At Bay Greg, you're safe. She had heard the camp corridors resounding with the shouts that Wilkes and Haljan were fighting. She had come upon a suit and helmet by the manual emergency lock, had run out through the lock, confused with her only idea to stop Wilkes and me from fighting. Then she had seen one of us killed. Impulsive, barely knowing what she was doing, she mounted the stairs, frantic to find if I were alive. Anita! Miko was coming. She had not seen him, for she had had no thought of brigands, only the belief that either Wilkes or I had been killed. But now, as for an instant we stood together on the rocks near the observation platform, I could see the towering figure of Miko nearing the top of the stairs. Anita, that's Miko. We must run. Then I saw my bullet projector. It lay in a bowl-like depression quite near us. I jumped for it, and as I tore loose from Anita, she leaped down after me. It was a broken bowl in the rocks, some six feet deep. It was open on the side facing the staircase, a narrow ravine-like gully full of gray, broken, tumbled rock masses. The little gully was littered with crags and boulders, but I could see out through it. Miko had come to the head of the staircase. He stopped there, his great figure etched sharply by the earthlight. I think he must have known that Coniston was the one who had fallen over the cliff, as my helmet and Coniston's were different enough for him to recognize which was which. He did not know who I was, but he did know me for an enemy. He stood now at the summit, peering to see where we had gone. He was no more than fifty feet from us. Anita, lie down. I pulled her down on the rocks. I took aim with the bullet projector, but I had forgotten our helmet lights. Miko must have seen them just as I pulled the trigger. The flying bullet missed him as he jumped sidewise. He dropped, but I could see him moving in the shadows to where a jutting rock gave him shelter. I fired again. Greg! I had stood up to take aim. I saw the bullet chip a bit of rock. 
Anita pulled me sharply down beside her. Greg, he's armed. It was his turn to fire. It came. The familiar vague flash of the paralyzing ray. It spat its tint of color on the rocks near us, but he could not reach us. Miko rose a moment later and bounded to another rock. I scrambled up and shot at him, but missed. Then he crouched and returned my fire from his new angle. But Anita and I had shifted. Time passed. Only a few moments. I could not see Miko momentarily. Perhaps he was crouching. Perhaps he had moved away again. He was, or had been, on slightly higher ground than the bottom of our bowl. It was dim down here where we were lying, but I feared that every moment Miko might appear and strike at us. His ray at any short range would penetrate our visor panes, even though our suits might temporarily resist it. Anita, it's too dangerous here. Had I been alone, I might perhaps have leaped up to lure Miko, but with Anita I did not dare chance it. We've got to get back to the camp, I told her. The autophone brought her comment. Perhaps he is gone. But he had not. We saw him again, out in a distant patch of earthlight. He was farther from us than before, but on still higher ground. We had extinguished our small helmet lights, but he knew we were here, and possibly he could see us. His projector flashed again, but we had shifted and were untouched. He was a hundred feet or more away now. His weapon was of longer range than mine. I did not answer his fire, for I could not hope to hit him at such a distance, and the flash of my weapon would help him with his aim. I murmured to Anita, We must get out of here. Yet how did I dare take Anita from these concealing shadows? Miko could reach us easily as we bounded away, in plain view in the earthlight of the open summit. We were caught, at bay in this little bowl. The camp from here was not visible. But out through the broken gully, beyond the staircase top, a white beam of light suddenly came up from below. Haljan. It spelled the signal. Haljan. It was coming from the Grantline instrument room, I knew. I could answer it with my helmet light, but I did not dare. I hesitated. Try it, urged Anita. We crouched where we thought we might be safe from Miko's fire. My little light beam shot up from the bowl. It was undoubtedly visible to the camp. Yes, I am Haljan. And I added, Help! Send us help! I did not mention Anita. Miko could doubtless read these signals, and in the camp they must have missed Anita by now. They answered, Cannot. I lost the rest of it. There came a flash from Miko's weapon, but it gave us confidence. He could not reach us at the moment. The Grantline beam repeated, Cannot come out. Port's broken. You cannot get in. Stay where you are, an hour or two. We may be able to repair ports. The ports were broken. Stay here an hour or two. But I could not hold this position against Miko that long. Sooner or later, he would find a place from where he could sweep this bowl beyond possibility of our hiding. I saw him running now, well beyond my range, to ferret out another point of vantage. I extinguished my light. What use was it to tell Grantline anything further? Beside, my light was dangerous. But the Grantline beam spelled another message. The brigand ship is coming. It will be here before we can get out to you. No lights. We will try and hide our location. And the signal beam brought a last appeal to me. Miko and his men will divulge where we are, unless you can stop them. The beam vanished. The lights of the Grantline camp made a faint glow it showed above the crater edge. The glow died as the camp was now plunged into darkness. Chapter 27 Anita's Plan We crouched in the shadows, the earthlight filtering down to us. The skulking figure of Miko had vanished, but he was out there somewhere on the crags, I was sure, lurking, maneuvering to where he could strike us with his ray. Anita's metal-gloved hand was on my arm. In my ear diaphragm, her voice sounded eager and unmistakable. What was the signal, Greg? She could not read the semaphore lights. I told her. Oh, Greg, the Martian ship coming? Her mind clung to that as the most important thing. But not so myself. To me, there was only the realization that Anita was caught out here almost at the mercy of Miko's ray. Grantline's men could not get out to help us, nor could I get Anita into the camp. She added, 
Where do you suppose the ship is? In telescopic view? Yes, twenty or thirty thousand miles up, probably. The stars and the earth were visible over us. Somewhere up there, disclosed by Grantline's instrument, but not yet discernible to the naked eye, Miko's reinforcements were hovering. I stood up cautiously to try and locate Miko. Immediately I saw him. He jumped as though fearing my coming bullet, and I dropped back, barely avoiding his flash, which swept across the top of our bowl. Craig, Craig, don't take such a chance. We lay for a moment in silence. It was horribly nerve-straining. Miko could be creeping up on us. Would he dare chance my sudden fire? Creeping? Or would he make a sudden, unexpected rush? The feeling that he was upon us abruptly swept me. I jumped to my feet, against Anita's effort to hold me. But again Miko had vanished. Where was he now? I sank back. That ship will be here in a few hours. I told her what Grantline's signal had suggested. The ship was hovering overhead. It must be fairly close for Grantline's telescope had revealed its identity as a bandit flyer, unmarked by any of the standard code identification lights. It was doubtless too far away as yet to have located the whereabouts of Grantline's camp. The Martian brigands knew that we were in the vicinity of Archimedes, but no more than that. Searching this glowing moon surface, our little lights, the tiny local semaphore beams we had momentarily been using, could easily pass unnoticed. But as the brigand ship approached now, dropping close to Archimedes as it probably would, our danger was that Miko and his men would then signal it, join it, and reveal the camp's location, and the brigand attack would be upon us. I told this now to Anita. The signal said, unless you can stop them. It was an appeal to me, but how could I respond to it? What could I do alone out here with Anita to cope with this enemy? Anita made no comment. I added, That ship will land near Archimedes, I imagine, within an hour or two. If Grantline can repair his ports, and I can get you inside. Again, she made no comment. Then suddenly she gripped me. Craig, look there. Out through the gully break in our bowl, the figure of Miko showed. He was running, but not at us. Circling the summit, leaping to keep himself behind the upstanding crags. He passed the head of the staircase. He did not descend it, but headed off along the summit of the curving crater rim. I stood up to watch him. He was making off, abandoning us. He's going. I let her stand up beside me, cautiously at first, for it occurred to me that this might be a ruse to cover some other of Miko's men who might be lurking up here. But the summit seemed clear. The figure of Miko was a thousand feet away now. We could see the tiny blob of it bobbing over the rocks. Then it plunged down, not into the crater valley, but out toward the open moon surface. Miko had abandoned his attack on us. The reason seemed plain. He had come here from his encampment with Coniston, had sent Coniston ahead to lure and kill Wilkes. When this was done, Coniston had flashed his brief signal to Miko, who was hiding nearby. It was not like the brigand leader to remain in the background. Miko was no coward. But Coniston could impersonate Wilkes, whereas Miko's giant stature at once would reveal his identity. Miko had been engaged in smashing the ports. He had looked up and seen me kill Coniston. He had come up to assail me, and then he had read Grantline's signal to me. It was his first knowledge that his ship was at hand. With the camp exits inoperative, Grantline and his men were imprisoned. Miko made an effort to kill me. He did not know my companion was Anita. The effort was taking too long, with the Grantline camp imprisoned and his ship at hand, it was Miko's best move to return to his own camp, rejoin his men, and await their opportunity to signal the ship. At least so I reasoned it. Anita and I stood alone. What could we do? We went to the brink of the cliff. The unlighted Grantline buildings showed vaguely in the earthlight. I said, we'll go down. I'll leave you there. You can wait at the port. They'll repair it soon, perhaps, and let you in. And what will you do, she demanded. I was hurrying her down the stairs, but suddenly she stopped. What are you going to do, Greg? I had not intended to tell her. Hurry, Anita. Why? She stood stock still. Through the visors, I could see her white face gazing at me rebelliously. Why should I hurry, Greg? 
because I want to leave you at the port. I'm going after Miko. Try and locate where he and his men are camping. I had indeed no specific plan as yet, but it seemed useless for me to sit at the port waiting to be let in. But he's gone, Greg. She was right on that. Miko was already a mile or more away, down on the outer surface, making off. He would soon be out of sight. It would be impossible to follow him. Greg, let me go with you. She jerked away from me and bounded back up the staircase. I caught her on the summit. Anita, I'm going with you. You're going to stay here. I'm not. This exasperating controversy and time was so precious. Anita, please. I'll be safer with you than waiting here, Greg. It almost decided me. Perhaps she would. It was only my intention to follow Miko at a distance. But with much more of this delay here, he would be lost to me. And she added, besides, I won't stay, and you can't make me. We ran along the crater top. At its distant edge, the lower plain spread before us. Far down and far away on the distant broken surface, the leaping figure of Miko showed. We plunged down the broken outer slope, reached the level. Soon as we ran, the little Grantline crater faded behind us. Anita ran more skillfully than I. Ten minutes or so passed. We had seen Miko and the direction he was taking, but down here on the plain we could no longer see him. It struck me that this was purposeless and dangerous. Suppose Miko were to see us follow him. Suppose he stopped and lay in ambush to fire at us as we came leaping heedlessly by. Anita, wait, I said, checking her. I drew her down amid a group of tumbled boulders. And then abruptly she clung to me. Greg, I know what we can do. Greg, don't tell me you won't let me try it. I listened to her plan. Incredible. Incredibly dangerous. Yet as I pondered it, the very daring of the thing seemed a measure of its possible success. The brigands would never imagine we could be so rash. But Anita... Craig, you're stupid. It was her turn to be exasperated. In truth, I was indeed in no mood for daring, for my mind was obsessed with Anita's safety. I had been planning that we might see the glow of Miko's encampment, and then return to Grantline, and hope that he would have the porch repaired. But, Greg, the safety of the treasure of all the Grantline men. To the infernal with that. It's you, your safety. My safety, then. If you put me in the camp, and the brigands attack it, and I am killed, what then? But this plan of mine, if we can do it, Greg, safety, in the end for all of us. And it seemed possible. We crouched discussing it, so daring a thing. The brigand ship would come down near Archimedes. That was fifty miles from Grantline. The brigands from Mars would not have seen the dark Grantline buildings hidden in the little crater pit. They would wait for Miko and his men to make their whereabouts known. Miko's encampment was ahead of us now, undoubtedly. We had been following him towards the Mare Imbrium. We were at its borders now. Archimedes from here was also about fifty miles. And Anita proposed that we go to Archimedes, climb in slope, and await the coming of the brigand ship. Miko would be off in the Mare Imbrium, or at least we hoped so. He would signal his ship but Anita and I, closer to it, would also signal it, and posing as brigands could join it. Remember, Greg, I am Anita Prince, George's sister. Her voice trembled as she mentioned her dead brother. They know that George was in Miko's pay, and I am his sister. It will help convince them. This daring scheme. If we could join the ship, we might be able to persuade its leader that Miko's distant signals were merely a ruse of Grantline to lure the brigands in that direction. A long-range projector from the ship would kill Miko and his men as they came forward to join it, and then we could falsely direct the brigands, lead them away from Grantline and the treasure. Greg, we must try it. Heaven help me, I yielded to her persuasion. We turned at right angles and ran toward where the distant frowning walls of Archimedes loomed against the starlit sky. End of Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings, chapters 25 through 27.